Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Cam. In this video, we're going to be carrying on with unit 11 and 21, and we're going to be approaching two ideas, index of hydrogen deficiency and an old idea, mass spectrometry, focusing more on the structure determination part of this unit. So, little question to go back over what we were looking at with error uncertainty last lesson, pause the video and give yourself a little bit of time to work on that one. Hopefully this question wasn't too difficult. We should have noticed that there was two uncertainties and we measured twice. So first of all, we need our overall volume, which was 16.35, subtracting five from 21.35. And then to propagate our uncertainty, we need to add the two absolute uncertainties of the measurement, giving us 16.35 plus or minus 0.04 centimeters cubed. So on with index of hydrogen deficiency. Really what this amounts to is it amounts to a measurement of how unsaturated a compound is, the degree of unsaturation, where a pair of hydrogen atoms missing is equivalent to one degree of unsaturation. So a saturated hydrocarbon with no rings would always have the maximum number of hydrogens and have the general formula CnH2n plus two. But if any of those carbon-carbon bonds are replaced with double, triple bonds, or there's any rings, then we're going to have a deficiency of hydrogen because they will be replaced as the carbons form these other bonds. And this can be determined from the structure of the molecule, of course, because we're able to see it, where a double bond is going to count as one degree of unsaturation. A triple bond will count as two degrees of unsaturation. But it's not just double or triple bonds. Also, a ring where the carbon chain joins back with itself will also count as one degree of unsaturation. Indeed, an aromatic benzene ring is going to have a degree of unsaturation of four. But if we think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? Because we have a ring structure with three double bonds, so that's three degrees of unsaturation, and the one degree of unsaturation from the ring structure. So we just added them together, really. Let's take those rules and draw an example. Take cyclobutene. That's a four carbon ring with a single double bond in there. Now we know a double bond counts for one degree of unsaturation, as we mentioned, but also the ring structure counts for another degree of unsaturation. So we have an IHD of two. Looking at another example like ethine, we can see here a triple bond counts as two degrees of unsaturation, and that's the only thing in this molecule that gives it an index of hydrogen efficiency, so it has an IHD of two. However, we can also calculate the IHD without actually knowing the structure of the molecule, which if you think about it is going to be a lot more useful because if we know the structure of the molecule, then it may not be as interesting for us to try and find this as we can see it from the structure. So there is a generic formula that we can follow where X is the number of carbons and where Y is the number of hydrogens that are present in the molecule. So we do, of course, need to know the molecular formula of the molecule. Now, there are some rules that we can follow that allow us to include other elements for how they would affect the generic formula. So the first that we'll consider is if there is oxygen and sulfur present in the molecule. And if there are oxygen and sulfur, they do not affect the IHD, so you don't need to change the value. However, if there is a halogen present, we are going to treat that like it's a hydrogen atom in our formula. So we add one to Y in our formula. For every nitrogen that we have present in the formula, we are going to treat that like one carbon atom and one hydrogen atom. So we're gonna add one to both X and Y for every nitrogen atom present. So let's try a couple of questions. 
First question then, determine the index of hydrogen deficiency of benzene. Pause the video to give yourself a moment for that. Pop them up! Well, you might have just remembered this one was four, but you could have also worked it out from knowing that every ring gives us one and every double bond gives us one, giving us a total IHD of four. In this question, have a go at using the IHD formula to calculate it instead. Pause the video to give yourself a moment for that. Pop them up! So remembering X is carbons and Y is hydrogens and oxygen does not affect our value. So we're just gonna have four for our value of X and eight for our value of Y, which solves to give us an IHD of one overall. Now, we've already looked at the concept of mass spectrometry and its uses in isotope mass determination in unit two. Go and check out that video if you need help with that. So I'm just gonna give a review of the process here, but we're mainly gonna focus on something called fragmentation and how that can help us determine the structure of molecules. So a quick recap of the process. A sample in mass spectrometry undergoes four main stages. It is ionized, then it is accelerated, it is then deflected, and then it is detected. And the radius of the path by which it is deflected in a known magnetic field helps us get, get an M over Z value, a mass over charge value, and that helps us determine the molecular mass. This is because a large M over Z value will not be deflected as much as one with a small M over Z value. So as we looked at in unit two, this can be used to determine the relative isotopic abundance of elements. However, it can also be used to characterize the structures of new compounds. And this utilizes something that happens in the ionization stage called fragmentation. Quite simply, fragmentation is just when the high energy electrons that are used to ionize these molecules can actually break the molecules up into their constituent parts and form charged particles that are not the same mass as the total molecule. What this means is, is the end spectra that we end up with has signals at many different M over Z values. Take this mass spectra for Cl2, for example. We know Cl has two isotopes, so we would expect three lines for the different combinations of those two isotopes. And we do see those at the molecular ion peak. However, we also see these other lines. And these other lines are formed when the Cl bond between the two chlorines is broken by one of these high energy electrons and also becomes ionized. So we end up with separate Cl ions that are then going all the way to detection. So we're getting these smaller fragments that are knocked off of the main molecule. This is obviously a very simple example. And if the fragments were larger, they may also decay into other smaller ions that then travel through to be detected. So in this instance, Cl2 plus could be composed of 35 plus 35 isotope or 35 plus 37 or 37 plus 37, which account for the three peaks towards the right hand side of the graph at the molecular ion peak. These two smaller peaks refer to the fragmented individual chlorine atoms that have been ionized and are showing a peak at around the mid 30s. So this process of fragmentation can be used to help us identify molecules. For example, here is the spectrum of C2H5Br and we have the molecular ion peak, which has equal distribution due to the two equally distributed bromine isotopes, which means they end up with the same abundance in 
their peaks on the mass spec. However, we also have these other smaller groupings and we have this other group down by 30. Now this is likely to do with C2H5 plus and around our just above our 90 mark and our 80 mark we're likely to have our bromine isotopes by themselves above the 90 mark we're likely to have bromine attached to a CH2 group so with the empirical formula and this spectra I'm able to deduce a lot about the structure of this molecule however don't worry not all of it has to be guesswork. Indeed, in your data booklet, you have a table which tells you what the relevant fragment peaks might represent to help you construct a picture of these molecules. Let's take this example of this spectra and using table 28 in your data booklet. It's given as the empirical formula CH2O and a mass spectrum. And it says deduce the molecular formula and a possible structure. So our first port of call is to have a look at our fragments list to see if we can find any clues about the structure. So upon inspection we see the mass loss of 15 which is always indicative of a CH3 group and we have a molecular ion peak of 60 along with fragments around 45. So the empirical formula of this compound total molecular mass would only be 30 so we know going back to doing empirical formula from unit one that the molecular formula must be twice that of the empirical formula aka c2h4o2 so we're able to deduce the molecular formula just from the molecular ion peak and the empirical formula we know there's a CH3 group and we also see at 45 that indicates a carboxylic acid group so we've got two groups here that are going to be very helpful and actually if we combine both of these together and remove our positive charges we conveniently get the mass of 60 so our compound was actually ethanoic acid. Now, truth be told, we wouldn't usually use mass spectrometry alone to determine the structure. This will often be used in conjunction with other techniques such as infrared spectroscopy or HNMR, which we'll be doing in the upcoming videos in this unit. So there are some questions for you to do on both of these concepts. And if you feel rusty on mass spec, I suggest checking out the videos in unit two on that. Thanks for joining me. Remember, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and as always, practice makes slightly better.